Um, yes, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, uh, both, uh, both uh, but it's nice to have a kind of conference close to where I live. Even better to have in a beautiful place. Even better with so many people who are really the people we need to actually make this work. So, as probably by now everybody knows, uh, 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 is that 2008 we had a workshop over at St. Hilda's, literally on the other side of town. Uh, a bit more water than here, this is a grander building. It was a very nice workshop. Of course, when you uh, started, we immediately had tech problems. I have an entire genre of uh, famous uh, scientists uh, 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 struggling with laptops and getting presentations to work. And the whole point of that 2008 uh, workshop was, let's bring together uh, the, the, these people who discuss mind uploading online with some serious uh, neuroscientists and some serious computer scientists and some nanotechnologists. Let's spend a weekend talking about this. See, is there a there there? Is there actually a potential for doing it for real? Is there a potential for actually in, uh, creating a field of research? And I think we got a good seed for that seed, a good seed for that field. It has grown gradually, not necessarily super fast, but uh, it has uh, had big effects. I also am very happy with the roadmap, which of course, when I look at it today, is a bit like looking at my kids' uh, drawings with crayons. Mm, that's cute, and it's also kind of embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> and, Already a few years later, we started talking, of course, we ought to do a follow-up because so much has happened. And now, 15 years later, we're actually doing the follow-up. That roadmap is interesting. I was checking the literature citations to it, and it got a fairly large number of citations. Yep. Um, and as an academic, of course, I'm always delighted. Uh, even when they're critical, there is one genre uh, of uh, the papers uh, kind of in the humanities talking about those weird transhumanists and their weird mythologies, and then they're citing that paper as some kind of evidence without actually engaging with any content, because I think the authors of that kind of paper don't really care about any content, because it's all about the mythos. On the other hand, there is also a surprising number of references from the AI safety world which might also explain why there are so many AI safety people around here. It's not just that AI safety is a rather hot topic right now. It's that some of the work in that roadmap about how much computing power is needed for a human brain equivalent is actually quite powerful uh, argument even when you're not trying to do brain emulation. And then there is also a whole bunch of papers from uh, many of you actually aiming at brain emulation and pointing towards that this might be a vision. At the same time, the question is, what has happened in between? Well, uh, uh, it seems like my animations don't work as they should. They never work as they should. But <coughs> one of the big, oops, yep, sorry, yep. OK, I thought I was dropping it, yep. Um, so here we see Randall, uh, also in Oxford, uh, talking about molecular ticker tapes. Uh, this was 2012, I think, at the Winter Intelligence Workshop. So generally, the biotech progress has been astounding. That, uh, that is uh, amazing. And it's interesting because this is not just progress like Moore's law, that uh, I'm happy to say Moore's law seems to have been on track uh, roughly as we guessed in 2008. That's good. But that is just essentially a scaling up of something. Uh, there is an interesting qualitative change, of course, in Moore's law that happened about the time of the original workshop that we went from faster and faster microprocessors executing instructions faster to parallelism which from our perspective is probably totally fine. Uh, indeed, many of the things we are interested in here tend to parallelize rather well, so more slow is on track for us. If you want to solve very long logical chains of deduction, like good old-fashioned AI, maybe there is trouble. But biotech is different because here the new things are actually new. They're very idea-based and qualitatively different. Similarly, uh, there was a whole bunch of neurotech projects happening. Some of them more successful than others, some of them achieving clear goals, some of them having a bit unclear goals or even having internal politics that got complicated. But the end result is that today we have quite a lot of better systems of interoperability. We have interesting uh, attempts at getting very large data sets. We're getting very big, complete connectomes of surprisingly large, uh, at least insect brains. We also have, as I've seen, the contentful simulations. 
back when we did the roadmap, uh, most of the really, really big uh, computational neuroscience simulations had a generic microcircuit for the cortex, and then you just uh, repeated that with some random variations, and then you were happy to get the kind of alpha and uh, gamma rhythms coming out of it, and you could write a paper about it. But it didn't correspond to any particular brain with any particular structure. We're still not there, but we're getting big simulations that are actually trying to incorporate more and more actual brain structure and become comparable. Um, so that is kind of uh, promising. Uh, and of course, in the meantime, various people have been writing uh, books uh, about it. Uh, I wrote a paper on the ethics of brain emulation that uh, Taylor and Francis decided was good enough or fun enough to actually make a little comic about, which really warms my heart, uh, especially since the protagonist looks a little bit more like me. Um, um, yeah. Another thing, I was mentioning the shift to GPU power already. Uh, so that is uh, interesting and demonstrates that, yep, we're on track for getting the right compute. There was this interesting issue. I think back in 2008, we were totally believing C elegance was the future. And maybe C elegance still is the future, but it turned out that C elegance was way more slippery than we believed. Uh, I think. Uh, the idea was, okay, we got the rough connectome uh, of C. elegans. Uh, how hard could it be to get the synaptic weights? Well, that turned out to be actually really hard for a bunch of mechanistic reasons. Uh, not even in a fancy scientific reason, but just it's very hard to actually do that kind of experiment. Uh, so while uh, Open Worm and many of the other uh, elegance emulation products, uh, they made progress. They didn't make as much progress as I would have predicted back in 2008. And that is an interesting caveat because C. elegance is still a wonderful model organism. But the fact that we were so wrong about which model organism would uh, allow us to do easy progress, that is a cautionary uh, thought. And then, of course, we have this little thing called artificial intelligence that has surprisingly actually done well in the intermediate time. Uh, indeed, this time uh, between the workshop and now has had this big, roaring uh, advance in AI. And the AI timelines might be one reason we're kind of feeling a bit stressed out these days, but it also implies that we're getting a lot of capabilities that might be very, very useful for brain emulation. Uh, when we had the first workshop doing image segmentation to actually take scan data and turn that into a nice three-dimensional structure was hard. It still is not trivial, but uh, the computer vision uh, side, yeah. People generally say, yeah, train a deep convolutional network. Uh, whatever you say, say in computer vision, that is the answer usually. And we might be getting other applications that might also help this. So that leads to the question, where are we now? And this is my kind of list of things that I think we should be thinking about. Uh, so the big one, and uh, you can tell that I'm in the philosophy department, is of course, yeah, can it actually be done? That's still not proven. We are still talking about something that uh, is speculative. I think most of us think that uh, it's uh, plausible enough that this is worthwhile working on. And indeed, if you can get brain emulations to do anything interesting, uh, philosophers of mind will have uh, a lot of fun uh, stuff to do. But there is also a really good set of scientific questions here that are interesting about the nature of how the brain works. Uh, one of my hobby horses that I will always bring up here is scale separation. Is the brain like a gas where the micro dynamics of molecules bumping against each other nicely averages out and gives us macro scale things like temperature, entropy and pressure? Or is it like a turbulent fluid where the vortices generate smaller vortices that affect the behavior of larger vortices and you need to simulate all the scales down to some very small micro scale? In which case, of course, brain emulation is going to be very, very hard. I think most of us who are here probably have some kind of faith that there is a scale separation going on. There has to be at some level, but it might still turn out to be at a really annoyingly low level. And I think we might want to figure out more about this. And this, even if you're talking to super skeptics about brain emulation, this is actually an area where we might want to join forces because this is an interesting question on its own. In standard computational neuroscience, we typically assume that, yeah, compartment in a cell model, that's roughly where we get scale separation. Is that proven well enough? Maybe, maybe not. It would be nice to have a better proof. And we might actually be able to do something about that. Uh, it might also be that um, this tells us interesting things about the general structure of brains. 
if we figure out what parts of brains are super sensitive and you need to do very high fidelity work versus this part where we can be actually fairly sloppy. Because brains, after all, are robust objects. They need to survive in a material world with a shaking head and uh, us eating stuff that is not uh, chemically pure and uh, subject to all sorts of randomizing influences. They need to have a fair bit of robustness. So obviously there is some sloppiness we could exploit, but the question is how much? And can we learn where we need to be very careful and where we can actually get away with a lot of stuff? This leads to another question, and that is how to put the pieces together. So the I think on scanning, a lot of lovely stuff has happened. But I haven't seen that many uh, scanning methods of uh, neural tissue produce uh, things that I can actually run in a computational neuroscience model. That is a gap. That needs to be bridged. There is an interesting and potentially hard part of how to interpret uh, the images and turn that into dynamics. And indeed, it might be that mm, it's kind of insufficient to just use Im uh, images. We might need those brain-computer interfaces, those behavioral videos, other ways of constraining this. And that, of course, also gets to the super important thing that Randall kind of totally blew my mind with at the first workshop, uh, validation. Uh, I remember actually kind of just waking up from my afternoon uh, slumber uh, during the meeting when Randall pointed out that, yeah, you need to have some actual system that you know how it works and the compare your simulation to it. Otherwise, you don't know that you're converging towards actually you know, the reality. And this is not an easy problem to solve when we get into squishy biology, because quite a lot of the methods we use are destructive. So you can't go back and check that, oh, this is actually what the neural tissue would have done, because now you don't have it anymore after all uh, and, uh, that uh, ima imaging and the slicing and scanning and uh, fixating. So there's some very deep problems there. Um, and then, of course, we have intra the big question that has already been alluded to. Can we do it faster? and faster than AI timers. And I think the question is ne should not be here, okay, what about the AI timers? I think it's an interesting question on its own. Where do we see that it's not just gaps in our research agenda or in the pipeline, but also where things are just not working as we should, that you might change how things work. Um, and this is tricky because many of us are working inside big institutions that don't like changing what works because that means various professors would be out of work. Others are at nimble startups who really would like to change how things work but might have economic incentives to solve one problem rather than another one. And there is a deep, interesting question that interests me as a futurist and that is, can we identify areas that are easy to speed up? and areas that are hard to speed up. For example, sometimes you need to have an intellectual breakthrough to solve a problem. That is super annoying because usually that means you can't throw money at it. Because yes, you can hire a bit more geniuses and that increases the probability of one of them having the good idea, but most likely that's not going to be how you get it. Uh, there are other areas where you can just hire a lot of engineers and have them solve it. You can sometimes do the Manhattan Project approach of uh, how do you isolate isotopes the best? You don't know from the start which one is the best, so you do all of them because you, you're the United States government on a war footing and you have all the money. They literally borrowed the silver from the treasury uh, to make windings for a, cyc a cyclotron. That's the level they could do with that resources. Turned out that that was not a useful method, but they returned the silver and said it was only slightly radioactive. <laughs> now, we might not be able to do that, but uh, there is an interesting question uh, about these strategies on setting up these uh, ways. And finding clever ways of organizing. Sometimes you want to parallelize things. You want to let a thousand flowers bloom and select the solution that works. Sometimes you want to focus a lot of effort on solving a problem you know can be solved. Sometimes you might want to see where are there profound disagreement. Let's figure out a way around that, either by doing two parallel projects or resolving that disagreement or doing something else. So that is basically my little uh, um, presentation. I, I've been thinking, I don't know if it's time for me to bring up the stuff I have in my one pager or, yeah. uh, yep. And, okay, yeah, it might actually be clever to do it on the screen. That's actually, actually much smarter than me reading from a laptop. Although I would like to advertise, of course, that I managed to get a four and a four side sticker on my laptop. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yep. and, and it works so nicely on a gray laptop. Uh, now, the interesting 
thing here is, I already mentioned a bunch of this. I think that the different parts of the whole, whole brain emulation product, as I envision it, they are differently advanced, and we might want to see where we need to push things to get things done earlier. That might still be something some of you might not agree on, because uh, I think uh, that it might be that some of you think that actually this is all the wrong uh, way of going about it. Personally, I think we have a lot of tr tricky stuff to solve on scan interpretation that might be that we want to wait until we have really good scans. But it might also be that actually we have good enough scans to start working on it so we can front load that. Um, there is uh, also uh, an issue of what about exotic stuff? Uh, and um, a simple example might be temperature. It's kind of trivial in one sense. Uh, many of the equations we have in computational neuroscience are temperature dependent, and you can just add that. Okay, you need to add some extra math. And you probably don't need to have a super elaborate map of temperatures in brains to make it work well. However, they do have a lot of really nonlinear interaction. I had some interesting conversations uh, with a neuroscientist about it, which means that as you change the temperature during the daily rhythm, you actually change the network properties. This is probably not a showstopper. It's fairly easy to deal with, but you need to remember to deal with that. There might be really weird ion channels and part of a chemical environment. And then we can continue going down the list towards weirder and weirder and weirder things. Are there electromagnetic interactions between action potentials running in parallel axons? There are some people who love bringing that one up. I don't think they matter in most healthy tissue, but maybe they do. And uh, then we can, of course, add more and more weirdness, and eventually we end up uh, with Sir Roger Penrose that maybe we have to have a microtubules in. Oh, yes, oh, yes. He's around Not here. Far from here. Oh, yeah, oh, yes. And uh, then I think he has an office in the Andrew Wise building uh, on, uh, overlooking the plaza tiled with Penrose tiles. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the interesting thing here is that. Uh, figuring out this exotica is probably going to happen when we try to simulate something and something doesn't work. And then we need a way of noticing where is the discrepancy coming from. And the tricky part about exotica might be that it's a different, going to be different types of weird stuff. If it's just that, oh, I left out yet another ion channel, I think uh, we might develop easy tools for doing that. But if it turns out that, oh, I actually need to care about the magnetic field, okay. That, if being good at figuring that one out, testing it out, or finding that actually that was irrelevant, we're going to have to need to deal with that. Biology tends to be weird and use whatever modalities it can find. We, let's just hope that there, none of them are too annoying. And simulation technology is another interesting thing. Virtual reality and, and, uh, is slightly popular these days, but the really interesting question is, can we do good body models? I think computer graphics is getting there quite nicely. Can we do good body internal models? That's an interesting thing that I don't think people have been working much on. Can we make the sensory world work well for uh, test animals? Because uh, you need to have a smell-based virtual reality for your drosophilia emulation. That is going to be uh, tricky because we don't do smell uh, virtual reality very much. So that is worth working on. Finally, uh, that figuring out more animal models, I think, uh, and the uh, organoids and other sources might be a very important thing to do. Security and ethics are really important, and they, it might sound very premature because we're at a very early stage. But generally, you can't add security to a product at the end. Then you get an insecure product that pretends to be secure. Uh, you can't do a, a product in an ethical manner if you don't start in an ethical manner. You want to embed this from the start. So by the time it actually gets big and powerful and affects the world, the, the ethics you built in actually is there. That, so it's worth thinking about. Um, there is a question where we can use AI. And uh, we already mentioned the timeline uh, argument. Uh, so it used to be around uh, the office that uh, people said, yeah, if you get brain emulation, you might learn scary stuff about uh, neural adaptivity and end up with a neuromorphic AI that we can't make safe and that uh, would be bad. Uh, so that's why we shouldn't be pushing brain emulation. Over the years, we have ended up with scary neuromorphic AI that we don't know how to align very well, but it's not even based on biology. So in some sense, it's way more boring, but powerful. But that entire argument against brain emulation has kind of fallen to the wayside. Yes, it might still be that we figure out the secret to the cortex, and then that can empower AGI. 
But I think it's very likely that whatever we figure out is not going to be directly applicable to the AGI, but might, if we play our cards well, help us uh, improve uh, brain emulation or just neuroscience and medicine, which is also useful things, even if we don't end up with a brain emulation. It's like we say, uh, aim for the moon and you might end up with the stars instead. Thank you. Thank you, that was really awesome. Um, so you mentioned that one thing that didn't get as much advanced as we thought was questions around scale separability, mm -hmm. or scale separation. And I'm wondering, so one thing that I saw kind of associated with that is that there's, a, there's a, an impetus to keep going on something that you feel works or where you have an intuition that that's the right level. And so we've had a lot of work in EM, and then I guess now expansion might possibly be related approaches. And because of the scale that they work at, this mm. takes a certain resolution, mm. and so that sort of says, okay, we're just honing in on this and saying that's our level, that's going to be sufficient. Maybe scale separation actually happens somewhat higher up, but less of a resolution than that, but, but this should be enough. And do you think that maybe there hasn't been enough attention paid? I personally don't worry about it too much, mm. but do you think there hasn't been enough attention paid to potentially higher resolution issues? Or uh, just because yeah. of the drive from mm. what you can do, right? Yeah, uh, and even if you're a student in computational neuroscience, quite often uh, you're going to work on some model with some software that you have uh, lying around. Actually building something on a different level is a lot of hard work. You, you want to hand that over to the professor, and the professor is busy writing grants anyway. So the end result is you're going to keep on uh, the same scale as other people uh, do it. So if you're interested in molecular interactions, then you will be doing that, but you're not going to be actually trying to shake how this integrates. The scale separation issue is very much cross-cutting, going between levels. And you certainly get people like Terry Sinovsky and others kind of doing these big, ha nice hand-wavy diagrams in the books that we're all nodding at. But there are relatively few strict good arguments about it. You get some arguments uh, about the diffusibility and time, uh, time uh, courses. So you can do more rigorous arguments, but I haven't seen much work on it, perhaps because it's not academically rewarded, even though I think it's both an important and actually fairly interesting question. Okay, maybe one more. Is there another one? Yeah. yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on building an ethic from the start? Uh, yeah, so part of it is that just figuring out uh, do we know roughly what we want? And I think in many cases we, ha we can use a fairly standard ethics. There is, for example, the issue about digital minds. Uh, in, in my ethics paper, I was pointing out that, yeah, while we might have a lot of really cool science fiction stories about uh, uploaded humans and the ethical problems they have, before that there is going to be a mountain of lab animals. And uh, if they matter morally, then this really matters uh, to do it right. There is a Wonderful paradox here, that a lot of animal rights activists who really hate uh, people doing experiments on animals really like us to use computational methods. And usually that is because they think that's just numbers in a computer. They don't have experiences. That virtual mouse uh, is not having actual pain. While or if you're on the transhumanist side and kind of hoping for a wonderful post-human experience uh, in the future, you actually have a good reason to be really worried about that mouse because if this works, that mouse might have real pain. So figuring this out in a good way or setting up the research agenda so you don't give too much pain to virtual mice uh, if they can feel pain. And we have an agenda of figuring out whether they actually feel pain. That would be very valuable. Cool. So now my question is, give us a challenge of something like how might we that people can mm. upload. Yeah. Uh, so the one on the top of my mind is how might we specify the full brain to interactive emulation pipeline, the different steps. And it might not be one pipeline, it might be that several of us actually have slightly different ideas about how it should look, and that might be a good idea to actually compare them uh, to each other. How might we specify? The full brain to uh, emulation pipeline. Uh, uh, yeah. And that, to the, attached to that pipeline, like weird si instruments, is of course the scientific methods of maintaining it, improving it, figuring out what it's missing, etc. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank, God and a Thank you. Day.